It's Monday, May 23rd, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, the ancient forest that was discovered at the bottom of a giant sinkhole in China. Plus, a species of moth not seen since 1912 was found in the luggage of a passenger at the Detroit airport. And the first patient has been injected with an experimental virus meant to destroy tumors. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. An ancient forest has been found at the bottom of a massive sinkhole in China. What a collection of magical words. And it sounds really fascinating, and it is, but to those in the know, it's not quite as shocking as it may sound from the headlines to us lay people. So the forest was discovered by cave explorers at the start of the month in China's Guangxi region. The sinkhole itself is about 1,000 feet long, 500 feet wide, and 630 feet deep, or deep enough to swallow the St. Louis Gateway Arch, according to Science Alert. Lei County is home to 30 sinkholes, but this one is remarkable for both being the largest and for being extremely deep, but shaped in such a way that light can filter in and allow for trees and other plants to grow. Lei County and the rest of southern China is made up of karst topography, which is a landscape prone to these types of sinkholes and the majestic caves they can create. Karst, according to National Geographic, is, quote, an area of land made up of limestone. Limestone, also known as chalk or calcium carbonate, is a soft rock that dissolves in water, and as rain seeps into the rock, it slowly erodes. Karst landscapes can be worn away from the top or dissolved from a weak point inside the rock. Karst landscapes feature caves, underground streams, and sinkholes on the surface. Where erosion has worn away the land above ground, steep rocky cliffs are visible. End quote. George Venney, the executive director of the National Cave and Karst Research Institute in New Mexico, told Science Alert, quote, Because of local differences in geology, climate, and other factors, the way karst appears at the surface can be dramatically different. So in China, you have this incredibly visually spectacular karst with enormous sinkholes and giant cave entrances and so forth. In other parts of the world, you walk out on the karst and you really don't notice anything. Sinkholes might be quite subdued, only a meter or two in diameter. Cave entrances might be very small, so you have to squeeze your way into them, end quote. Or as National Geographic points out in the Yucatan Peninsula, the karst sinkholes have been filled with water, becoming cenotes. And, quoting Science Alert, In fact, 25% of the United States is karst or pseudo-karst, which features caves carved by factors other than dissolution, such as volcanics or wind, Vinny said. About 20% of the world's landmass is made of one of these two cave-rich landscapes. Guangxi is known for its fabulous karst formations, which range from sinkholes to rock pillars to natural bridges, and have earned the region UNESCO World Heritage Site designation. End quote. And from The Guardian, Zhong Yuanhai, a senior engineer at the Institute of Karst Geology of the China Geological Survey, told the state news agency Xinhua that the site had three caves in its walls and a well-preserved primitive forest at the bottom. Scientists trekked for hours to reach the base of the sinkhole to see what it contained. Chen Li Xin, who led the expedition team, said that as well as the trees, there was a dense undergrowth on the floor that came up to his shoulders. I wouldn't be surprised to know that there are species found in these caves that have never been reported or described by science until now, he said. End quote. And indeed, caves like these can sometimes become home to all sorts of flora and fauna that aren't typically found above ground in those regions. For example, according to Science Alert, there's a cave in West Texas filled with tropical ferns, the spores of which were most likely carried there by bats migrating from South and Central America. These sinkhole caves can also function as conduits for aquifers, but they have the downside of being the only aquifers that can be polluted with solids. Venny, the expert from the National Cave and Karst Research Institute, says that he's, quote, pulled car batteries and car bodies and barrels of God knows what and bottles of God knows what out of the active cave stream, end quote. But over at the sinkhole in Guangxi, scientists will be more likely to find plants and insects previously unknown to scientists, as opposed to car batteries. The dense undergrowth that the cave explorers and later scientists waded through in the sinkhole included thorns, fig plants, and a rare type of bamboo. 
What they find in this sinkhole will be pretty cool on its own, but its unique features will also serve as an important scientific comparison to the other karst sinkholes in the region. And if you want to take a look at the sinkhole for yourself, there is a video in the Washington Post link in the show notes from CGTN, the Chinese state-run TV news, featuring the scientists exploring and some of the footage that they shot with drones before rappelling down into the plant-covered hole. The U.S. Transportation Security Administration, a.k.a. the TSA, a.k.a. the folks who make sure you took off your shoes and shoved your toiletries into a 3.4-ounce container but are no longer paid to care if you wear a mask, have long had a very strong Instagram game. Years ago, the administration started posting photos of the weirdest things people tried to take through security, with a weekly weapon roundup to really blow people's minds. Like, seriously, the number of machetes people try to take in their carry-ons. These days, the TSA still shares bizarre items that get flagged, but have also added in travel tips, offbeat airport sightings, and ample dad jokes to their Instagram lineup. And one unique airport finding that made it beyond the TSA's Instagram all the way to national news was found last September in Detroit. A rare type of moth last seen in 1912 in Sri Lanka was found in the bag of a passenger traveling from the Philippines. Quoting NBC News, The insects were inside seed pods that the passenger claimed were for medicinal tea, said Chris Gogan, a spokesperson with Customs and Border Protection. Insect holes were found in the pods, and the moths were seized, Grogan said. The insects hatched in quarantine, revealing raised patches of black bristles. End quote. The moths were later, quote, disposed of via steam sterilization, end quote, which might seem like a bit much, but non-native species can often pose quite the threat to new environments. Think of the infamous murder hornets, which only appeared in the U.S. in 2019, or the spotted lanternflies that have been a scourge on the East Coast since first appearing in 2014, or the New York Times points to the emerald ash borer, an Asian beetle that also originated in Detroit and has the potential to kill 99% of the U.S.'s ash trees. After identifying the larvae and pupae of the moths that the passenger had been transporting, experts said that were they to have spread, they could contaminate or decimate crops and defoliate forests. Quoting the New York Times, The moths, whose black and gold dotted wings resemble a cloudy pre-dawn sky, looked to be a member of the moth family Pyrolidae, the customs officials said. To determine their exact species, the authorities sent the specimens to an expert at the Smithsonian Institution, according to the announcement. The species of moth was Salma brachyscopalis hampson, named for the British entomologist George Hampson, according to Jason Dabrowski, a lepidopterist at the Insect Diagnostic Lab at Cornell who specializes in identifying moth species. End quote. That the moth was noticed at all and sent to the proper place to be identified and the potential threat of its spread mitigated is all actually really impressive. David Moskovitz, an entomologist, environmental consultant, and co-founder of National Moth Week, emphasized how it really goes to show the importance of training in animal taxonomy for the TSA. You know, we think so much about violence and terrorist threats, which, like security theater aside, is very important, especially as rising stress levels in the nation contribute to more and more violence from unruly passengers. But threats of disease and destruction from non-native species is also a huge one that doesn't get talked about too much. And Moskowitz points out that there's the side of protecting and conserving the species themselves, but then there's also protecting against invasive pests, particularly as lines of the supply chain switch up a bit in light of shortages and the world becomes ever more interconnected. It might sound like making a mountain out of a moth hill, but protecting our crops and our own species of plants and animals, including ourselves, from disease and blight is an age-old challenge that has threatened countless civilizations in the past. Just because it isn't as cool and action hero-y as protecting people from bad guys with guns doesn't mean it isn't as important. And in the same way that we take so many precautions against the possibility of bad human actors, we've got to stay just as vigilant when it comes to invasive species. As Dombrowski said, quote, Would this moth have become the next multi-billion dollar pest? Probably not. But it's possible. End quote.
The first patient has just been given an experimental virus therapy meant to destroy cancer in solid tumors. This is the first human clinical trial of this particular drug candidate from co-developers LA-based City of Hope Cancer Care and Research Center and Australia-based biotech company ImmuneGene. Quoting Science Alerts, the drug candidate, called CF33HNIS, a.k.a. Vaccinia, is what's called an oncolytic virus, a genetically modified virus designed to selectively infect and kill cancer cells while sparing healthy ones. In the case of CF33, the modified pox virus works by entering cells and duplicating itself. Eventually, the infected cell bursts, releasing thousands of new virus particles that act as antigens, stimulating the immune system to attack nearby cancer cells. Previous research in animal models has shown the drug can harness the immune system in this way to hunt and destroy cancer cells, but up until now, no testing has been done in humans." End quote. And from IFL Science, the new trial will enroll 100 patients with metatastic or advanced solid tumors who have received at least two other forms of standard care treatment prior to starting the trial. The enrolled patients will receive vaccinia therapy either by injections directly into the tumor site or intravenously. Once enough patients have received the first lowest dose of vaccinia to test for safety, the researchers will combine it with another immunotherapy antibody, pembrolizumab, which could increase the immune system's capacity to fight off cancer cells. The combination of both could make the therapy more effective against tumors that are more difficult to target. Interestingly, the same characteristics that eventually make cancer cells resistant to chemotherapy or radiation treatment actually enhance the success of oncolytic viruses such as CF33 HNIS, said Yuman Fung, MD, the Sanjacomo family chair in surgical oncology at the City of Hope and the key developer of the genetically modified virus. He said further, We are hoping to harness the promise of virology and immunotherapy for the treatment of a wide variety of deadly cancers. End quote. Now, Gizmodo notes that oncolytic virus therapy is a concept that scientists have been hopeful about for over a century, after first noticing in the 1800s that patients with cancer would go into remission temporarily after a viral infection. Quoting further, in recent years, some teams have decided to explore a slightly different plan of attack. This genetically modified virus not only infects and harms cancer cells, but also forces these cells to become more recognizable to the immune system. This strategy, the researchers hope, will then allow other treatments that also boost our immune response to cancer cells to be more effective, particularly against hard-to-target solid tumors. These treatments are collectively known as immunotherapy. In early animal and lab experiments, the virus has been shown to reduce the size of colon, lung, breast, ovarian, and pancreatic cancer tumors." End quote. And as we all likely remember from following the news of the COVID-19 vaccines, phase one trials are early days. Their primary purpose is testing the safety and dosage of the drug. It is not a sure sign that the drug is effective as a treatment across the board or that it will even proceed from here. But, quoting Science Alert, which doesn't mean we can't get excited about the broad potential here, just that we should keep our expectations in check. If the drug does turn out to be safe and well-tolerated, we could be looking at a powerful new tool for fighting tumors, described as a game-changer because of how potent it is and because of its ability to recruit and activate immune cells, according to surgical oncologist Suzanne Warner, who previously led a team studying the effects of CF33 on tumors in mice. End quote. And were CF33 to go all the way and prove to be that game-changing treatment for humans, it would join TVEC, the oncolytic virus therapy for melanoma I mentioned earlier this month, as only the second ever FDA-approved oncolytic virus therapy for cancer. Well, I don't know if anyone listening is as emotional a David Bowie fan as I am, but if you are, brace yourself before watching the just-released trailer for the upcoming documentary Moon Age Daydream. Directed by Brett Morgan and premiering today at Cannes, the documentary features never-before-seen footage from Bowie's personal archives and is narrated by the late musician himself. This is the first documentary about the artist to be produced with the blessing of his family, specifically his widow Iman, who had previously 
obviously turned down other documentary and biopic pitches because they didn't seem to fit with something that Bowie would have said yes to himself. Morgan, however, seemed to get the vision, coming in with a track record that includes the incredible Kurt Cobain montage of Heck, and he was aided by one of Bowie's producers, Tony Visconti, for the soundtrack. Early reviews are calling it a cinematic odyssey, which does come across in the trailer, and the trailer really hits on Bowie's style and especially the expansive life and death heaviness that Bowie imbued into his final album, Black Star. After making its debut today at Cannes, Moon Age Daydream will have a theatrical release this fall before streaming on HBO Max. But that is it from me for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.